It's my great pleasure in introducing to you our keynote speaker for the day, Dr. Mark McLaughlin. Dr. McLaughlin is a professor at the Department of Chemistry at the University of British Columbia and the director of UBC's Create Nanomaterials program. He did his undergrad at UBC before he joined the University of Toronto for a PhD in the Department of Chemistry, where he explored new directions in inorganic polymers. From here, he went on to do a postdoc at MIT before he came back to Canada to join UBC's, uh, UBC as a faculty member. Dr. McLaughlin is known for his work in cellulose nanocrystals and other supramolecular nanomaterials, and has been re recognized for his research with various national and international honors, including the Stesi Prize for Natural Sciences, awarded to one person each year and is considered one by many as the most prestigious award for young scientists in Canada. Last year, he was also elected as a fellow of the Royal Society. Apart from this, he's a, apart from being a phenomenal scientist, Dr. McLaughlin also enjoys teaching, and a quick visit to ratemyprof.com shows that he's well received by all students. <laughs> and for those of you who are looking for new study music, his rendition of the periodic table song can be viewed on YouTube. With that, Please put your hands together to welcome Dr. Mark McLaughlin onto the stage. All right, thank you very much for that really kind introduction. And uh, it's a great honor for me to be here. And I, I just want to warn you, if you do go and look at on, on uh, YouTube for the video of me singing the periodic song, I was not completely sober at the, on that particular day. <laughs> that, that was at a department Christmas party uh, where I got challenged to do it after far too many drinks, so I can do it much better. <laughs> so I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to come here and talk to you about nanoscience. And it's, it's awesome to see this organized, this opportunity for undergraduates to interact and to ha have a, a meeting focused on nanomaterials is unprecedented as, in Canada as far as I know. So today I want to talk to you about some chemistry that we've been doing at UBC with nanomaterials. And I'll just start with uh, an introduction to my, my views on nanoscience and nanomaterials. You know, I think, as we heard from the last speaker, that we're really at a, a, a point in history where nanomaterials are poised to, to undergo a revolution. They're poised to revolutionize the way we have medicine through nanomedicine, electronics, sensing. It won't be long before nanomaterials are in almost everything that we interact with in our daily lives. And at a focus of, or one important um, aspect of nanotechnology and nanoscience is nanomaterials, and that's where my research interests lie. So nanomaterials are materials with dimensions, at least one dimension between one and 100 nanomaterials. And where can we find these? We can already find them in a lot of different devices. There are now uh, televisions that have quantum dots in their displays. Uh, tennis rackets that have nanomaterials inside of them to make them stronger. These, these pants that you can buy from the store have silver nanoparticles for making them um, antibacterial and also, uh, I think, wrinkle resistant. And various ap other things that you can buy in the store now already have nanomaterials incorporated into them. So how do we make nanomaterials? There's really two approaches that are commonly used. One is called the top-down approach, where you start with a big object and you grind it down until you get the small object of, with the size that you desire. The second approach is um, a, kind of a more elegant approach, which is the bottom-up approach, taking atoms, clusters, or other building blocks and assembling them into the nanomaterials that we desire. And this is often called the Lego approach to materials chemistry. And this is how nature builds its materials um, in your body. So you can take a very, a very elegant approach here, demonstrated by some work by Makoto Fujita at the University of Tokyo, is he builds these molecules that spontaneously self-assemble into these giant clusters, and then he can template other nanomaterials inside of their pores, and they're all monodisperse and have very unique properties. So what's different about nano? Well, compared to bulk substances, there are a lot of aspects that make nanomaterials really, really interesting. One thing is that, obviously, their size, they're much smaller than bulk materials, but also they can have shapes that impart different properties on the materials. 
They can exist in different phases or arrangement of the atoms than you get in the bulk. Um, they have size distributions, which lead to different properties. We have to worry about the defects on the atomic scale. They have high surface areas, and there's a possibility of, of looking at their chemistry of their surfaces for coding and making them um, interact with different environments in different ways. Curvature becomes a factor. If you have a block of gold, you don't worry about the curvature of your block of gold. But when you have gold nanoparticles, the, gold, the curvature of the gold nanoparticles changes their properties immensely. Their organization into higher ordered structures changes their properties. And the electronic structure, of course, of nanomaterials affects their um, properties. So just to, to illustrate a couple of examples, this is a photograph of a, a block of bulk gold. And if you cut this down into gold nano rods, then you get different colors um, of nano rods. And you can, by changing the size of the nano rods, you can tune their absorption across the whole spectrum. Another example are cadmium selenide quantum dots shown in this photograph here. And by changing their size between 2 nanometers and 8 nanometers, we can tune the wavelength that they fluoresce across the entire spectrum. And these kind of nanoparticles are now being used in quantum dot televisions, as well as medical diagnostics. So I mentioned shapes of nanomaterials. And there are a lot of different shapes that have appeared. And I just show you a couple of examples. We're very good at making nanoparticles. We can make core shell nanoparticles with different compositions on the inside and outside. We can make nano rods of different sizes. You can even make these tetrapods, which have four nano rods bridged by a nanoparticle at the center, um, triangles, and so on. And there's, there's literally thousands of different shapes of nanomaterials that have been made. And the shapes really do affect their properties. So shown here are photographs of solutions of gold nanomaterials that are all about the same size. These are spherical particles, pentagonal structures, hexagonal crystals, um, triangular plates, and nano rods. And you can see that even though they're about the same size, they have very different optical and electronic properties. I think one really exciting area, as far as I can tell, is the use of DNA to build nanomaterials. And DNA, of course, in our bodies is just a genetic material. But people are looking at using DNA as a scaffold for making new mechanical materials and different nano devices. So if you take DNA, you can make it assemble by picking the right um, sequence of base pairs into cubes, into smiley faces. I don't know of any commercial applications of the smiley faces yet, but it's a, a great photo. Um, you can make three-dimensional objects. This is a, a gear that's about 50 nanometers across. You can make vases out of DNA. Just by, this is a single sequence of DNA that self-assembles spontaneously into this vase when you deposit it on the surface or in solution. And you can make other stuff like nanotubes. So I think you guys are entering this field at the right time. There are some big challenges, or as I say, some not so nano challenges in this field that need to be addressed. Um, some of the things that we need people to look at in the future are the synthesis of nanomaterials, especially reproducibly controlling the size, shape, and structure of materials so they have exactly the same optical and electronic properties for different applications. Integration of nanomaterials with devices. This is a really complex one. It's great to have all these really small nano features on a surface, but as soon as you have to connect a wire that is several microns in diameter to it, you can often lose some of the nano effects um, unless you are clever about how you connect it. Characterizing nanomaterials. Um, there has been huge achievements in the characterization of nanomaterials, and this continues to be an area that's challenging. It's not, you can't just put nanomaterials under an optical microscope and see them, but you need really new technologies, and this is a hot area for development. And toxicity and environmental impact. This is a really important area as well. As nanomaterials have more significant roles in our society, we need to know where they end up you know, in terms of the environment, in, in solution, and in the groundwater, and also how they interact with your skin and with your body and, and other organisms. So there are some significant opportunities, though, where nanomaterials are poised to revolutionize the way um, we live. Sensing, 
I, I can see that we'll be walking into doctor's offices in 20 to 50 years and they will be able to have nanomaterials embedded in sensors that will be able to detect any disease you have just from a breath or from a swipe of your skin. Um, nanomedicine, where you can have nanorobots, for example, going through your blood veins or arteries and, uh, and treating diseases. That sounds very far-fetched, but if you ask people 100 years ago whether computers would revolutionize our world, they would have said, what's a computer? Right? A computer was something that had to be hand-cranked 100 years ago, and um, there was obviously no vision for it to be useful, as useful as it is today. Scaling electronics is obviously a huge um, area of, for nanomaterials, and catalysis as well in industrial-scale plants. So with that, I want to shift gears now and tell you about our research with cellulose. So we started with nano, now we go big to trees. Trees are made of about 50% cellulose, and cellulose is the most abundant natural material or natural polymer on Earth. It's present in all plants, and it's also present in a number of bacteria and um, animals like tunicates. So these, this is a photograph of a piece of paper. Probably already today you've encountered a piece of paper at some point. And, but probably very few of you have bothered to look at paper under an electron microscope. And if you did, you would see it's got this woven fibrous structure of mostly cellulose. So cellulose is made of these nanocrystals of cellulose that are bridged by amorphous regions. And it was shown back in the 1950s that if you take a regular piece of paper and you treat it with sulfuric acid under the right conditions, that you can hydrolyze the amorphous regions and isolate these nanocrystals of cellulose. These are about 5 to 10 or 5 to 30 nanometers in diameter and a couple hundred nanometers long. Here's an electron microscope of cellulose nanocrystals. And you can see these ones are about 5 to 10 nanometers in diameter and a couple hundred nanometers long. Just to put this into perspective, the length of these um, cellulose nanocrystals, about 200 nanometers, is roughly 1,000th the width of a human hair. So these are really, really small compared to the things we're commonly familiar with. Some of the properties of cellulose nanocrystals, they have extremely high tensile strength, higher than steel for their weight. Um, they're dispersible in water, so you can form stable solutions in water. Uh, they're functionalizable. You, they have potential applications that are being explored now for oil drilling fluids, incorporation into paints, food products, pharmaceuticals, coatings, composites, and reinforcing plastics and so on mostly where they modify the viscosity or the strength. Now this is a beaker of nanocrystalline cellulose in water. If you pour this onto a surface and let the water evaporate, you get a colored iridescent film. So there is no dye or pigment in this solution, it's colorless, but you get color when it dries. So the origin of this color is something called structural color. And structural color is found in many examples in nature. There are many bird feathers that get their coloration, not from dyes or pigments, but rather from structural order on the nanoscale. Um, there are examples of fish scales, many insect shells that also get their coloration from structural color, even some berries and fossils that they get their coloration from structural order. One famous example is the morpho butterfly. It has these beautiful blue iridescent wings. But actually, if you hold it up to the light and look through it, the wings are really brown in color. And the blue that you see is due to diffraction. So if you look at the blue wings under a microscope, you can see these features. And then under an electron microscope, you can see these chitin features, which have spacings of about four or 500 nanometers. And as a consequence of this repeating structure at the nanoscale, they selectively reflect blue light from their structures, and that's the origin of the beautiful blue iridescence in the morpho butterfly. So coming back to the cellulose nanocrystals, we get this beautiful um, iridescent color, and it comes from structural order at the nanoscale. And in this case, the structural order is something called chiral nematic ordering. And I want to illustrate for you what this looks like. 
So these are rod-shaped particles, which have the shape of my fingers. And when they come down and dry on a surface, they tend to align in one direction. Next layer comes down, and it aligns on top of that layer, but it twists a little bit. Next layer comes down, and the rods align, and they twist a little bit more. And so what you build up is a layered structure where the rods are aligned within each layer, but they twist as they go through the stack. And they do it again and again. And when the pitch of that helical structure matches the wavelength of incident light, it's selectively diffracted. So to illustrate on the screen for you what this structure looks like, this is sort of what the first layer of cellulose nanocrystals would look like, the next layer, the third layer, and so on. Whoops. And so here's a representation of what these cellulose nanocrystals look like as they go through the film. And when that pitch matches the wavelength of incident light, it's selectively diffracted, and that's called iridescence. So by changing the pitch of the structure, we change the color of the film. And that will be important as I go through this talk. So now that I've introduced you to cellulose nanocrystals, and to this chiral pneumatic order that gives rise to the iridescence, I want to tell you about what we tried to do. We wondered whether we could transfer this chiral pneumatic organization of cellulose nanocrystals to a solid state material like glass, which is just silica. So for this talk, there's only one chemical reaction you need to know. And that is the sole gel reaction. If you take tetramethoxysilane and you add it to water, it undergoes hydrolysis and condensation to give silica, which is just glass, that's what our windows are made of, and methanol. And so when you do this reaction, the silica that you get is not crystalline like quartz, but rather it's an amorphous network of tetrahedral silicon atoms bridged by oxygens. So here's the chemistry. You take that beaker of cellulose nanocrystals in water, and you add tetramethoxysilane that we buy from a chemical supply company. And then we stir it. And then you pour it into a, a Petri dish. And you just leave it on your bench overnight to let the water evaporate. And so I'm going to show you a video of the water evaporating at a little bit of a, a higher speed. <laughs> so you don't have to stay here all day. So now the water is evaporating. And you can see the color magically appear as the cellulose nanocrystals start to organize into their helical twist. And after it's all done, you get a cracked film, which is colored and iridescent. So this is a composite now of glass, silica, and cellulose nanocrystals. And the cellulose nanocrystals are coiled into this helical structure inside of the glass to give the iridescence that you see. Now what we do is we burn our material. So you take this glass and cellulose composite and cook it at 600 degrees in the air. And that destroys all of the cellulose. And what we're left with is just a piece of glass, pure silica. Now this silica we look at by gas adsorption measurements. So in a gas adsorption measurement, we look at how easily nitrogen adsorbs on the surface. And this gives us information about the surface area and the porosity of our materials. And so what we find is that these materials have a very high surface area, typically 650 to 1,000 meters squared per gram. And to give you some perspective of that, one gram of our glass has half the surface area of an NHL ice rink. Um, we also get information about the pore size. And the size of the pores is around 4 or 5 nanometers in diameter, which is about the same as the width of the cellulose nanocrystals that we use as a template. So this material is pure glass. What color is glass? It's clear. It's colorless, right? That's why we make windows out of it. But our materials are colored. And we can make glass films that are red, yellow, blue, green any color we want, just by tuning the conditions that we use to make the materials. We can make films that are colorless but reflect infrared light. 
We can make films that are colorless but reflect UV light. In fact, we can tune it by almost 2,000 nanometers now. If you look at the, the yellow film from the top and you tilt your viewing angle, it turns blue. So because this is a diffraction principle, there's a sine theta angle dependence on the coloration of the materials. So when we first reported these materials, I got contacted by a couple of architects in Vancouver who wanted to, to use our material to coat the front of a condominium building. It's glass, and architects like working with glass, and their idea was that as you walk down the street, the building would change color, which would give a really neat effect. But unfortunately, when I told them that these were the biggest pieces that we could build at the time, this is a dime for size reference, um, they immediately hung up the phone on me. <laughs> and I'll show you in a few minutes how we've tried to address this problem. Now, you can't look at the, the nanostructure of these with an optical microscope because the nanostructure is just too small. So we use electron microscopy to look at our materials. If you take a cross-section of the film, you cut it, and look at it by a scanning electron microscopy, you can see this well-ordered layered structure. And if you look at the top of the film, it's relatively smooth, but the edges have these undulations, which are characteristic of this structure. If we zoom in and do high-resolution electron microscopy of this region, we can actually resolve a left-handed helical twist to our glass. We've used another technique called helium ion microscopy, which instead of using a beam of electrons to image our material, it uses a beam of helium cations. And this allows you to get higher resolution images without the need for a conductive coating on the, on the film. And so what we can see here are the pores in the material. And this spot is where the pores are aligned parallel to the screen. And they rotate one half pitch to here, where they're also rotating they're oriented parallel to the screen. So by measuring this distance, that's one half pitch of our chiral pneumatic phase. So what we've been able to do then is to, using cellulose nanocrystals as a template, we can incorporate them into this helical structure inside of a piece of glass. And then when we burn them out, we're left with a piece of glass that now has holes organized into this helical structure. And it's the arrangement of the holes inside of the glass that gives rise to the optical properties that you see. So it's a negative of the original cellulose nanocrystals. So what can we do with this material? I want to show you, as we go through the rest of the talk, a number of different applications and interesting properties of the materials we've been making from cellulose nanocrystals. So the first one is that this glass is very porous. So if you add a drop of water to the surface, it goes inside of the channels and makes the film colorless and transparent in that region because of refractive index matching with the glass. And so this is a photograph of four films with droplets of water on them. And it goes back to the original color. In fact, because this is a structural color and not due to some dye or pigment that might be less stable, we can take these films and heat them at 800 degrees overnight in the air, and they stay the same color. You can also blast them with a laser, and they don't undergo photo bleaching because they don't absorb light. They only reflect it. Um, so what we've developed here is a rain sensor. If you want to know whether or not it's raining outside, you can take a sample of our material, hold it out your window, and if it becomes <laughs> colorless and transparent, then you should take your umbrella with you. So anybody looking for a spin-off company idea, I, I see some economic potential here. Not. OK. <laughs> All right. Actually, we've been exploring these materials for sensing. Because the, the, although your eye you, it looks completely colorless and transparent, with a spectrometer, it's much more sensitive to the refractive index difference between what's inside of the channels and the glass. And we've been able to sense very small changes in refractive index. And we can do this even with colored solutions by using circular dichroism spectroscopy, which I'm not, I'm not going to go into today. Um, and we've been developing, we've published a few papers now on using these materials for sensing, not just rain sensing. So I mentioned before that one of the limitations is the size of the, the pieces of glass that we could prepare. 
And the problem is that as you saw in the video, as this solution evaporates, you get these pressure gradients that build up in, during the sole gel process, and that leads to cracking. So we made an accidental discovery one day that we could prevent cracking by adding sugar to our solution. And here's a solution where we, this is cellulose nanocrystals and glass with 28 weight percent of glucose in this case, and we get a large crack-free film. So here's a photograph now of that crack-free composite film beside the same dime. And then we can calcine this in air and get large crack-free pieces of chiral pneumatic mesoporous glass, which are iridescent just like the small pieces. So here's a photograph of the red film viewed from the top. When you tilt your viewing angle, it looks green. And if you put water in the left side of the glass, it completely disappears due to the refractive index matching again, and it's totally reversible. Some of the potential applications of this new chiral glass that we're looking at, um, separation of molecules. It's been demonstrated now that these materials can be used for separating enantiomers, that is molecules that exist as a left and a right-handed form, which is about 90% of the drug molecules that are in the pipeline. Um, we can use these materials for color filters and polarizers, infrared and UV reflectors, sensors, as I mentioned before. We can use them to template other materials to make other materials that are, have a helical structure. Catalyst supports and decoration. We're looking at these materials for enhancing the color of paints and for um, making new ornaments. And you need to use your imaginations to see if you can come up with other applications for these materials. We think that there's probably lots of opportunities and we're waiting for a, somebody to come forward with a good idea. So one really neat aspect of these materials is that they have a connection with nature. Shown here is a photograph of the jewel beetle, which has this bright iridescent shell. And it gets its coloration from a chiral pneumatic arrangement of chitin nanocrystals. So it has a left-handed helical arrangement of chitin nanocrystals on its shell. Um, so our material is sort of a biomimetic beetle shell. And so I am actually traveling around the world looking for beetles that may have lost one part of their shell because we can provide them with a prosthetic beetle shell <laughs> and give them a second chance to fly. <laughs> I find it amazing that nature has figured out how to organize chitin nanocrystals into the same structures that give the same iridescent structures as our synthetic cellulose derivatives do. And I should just mention that chitin is structurally very similar to cellulose. It's just got a little bit of different functionality. We've been able to extend this to organosilicas, where the silicon atoms are not all um, bonded to four oxygens, but they're bonded to one carbon atom and three oxygens. And this allows us to make more flexible materials. As you can imagine, the glass itself is very brittle. These are thin films of glass. But by incorporating organics in it, we can make more flexible materials. So I'm going to show you a video of us handling this chiral pneumatic mesoporous organosilica. So we can actually make large films of this chiral pneumatic mesoporous organosilica, and you can bend it, and you can flex it. You can wrap it around objects for coloration. Um, we've been looking at gas diffusion through this because the pores are just a little bit bigger than a lot of gas molecules that you might want to separate, like carbon dioxide and nitrogen. Um, and there's some really neat opportunities here as well. Oh, yeah, this brings me to another movie. So how many of you have been to a 3D movie lately? Apparently you guys aren't getting enough homework here in the undergraduate program at Waterloo. You have time to go to the movies. We don't give our students time to go to the movies. No, I'm just kidding. This is a pair of 3D glasses that you'd wear at a 3D movie. 
And the way that 3D movies work now is they project two beams onto the screen, one that's left-handed circularly polarized light and one that's right-handed circularly polarized light. And because of the physical nature of our glasses, they only reflect left-handed circularly polarized light. So I want to show you what our films look like if you wear these 3D glasses. So this is a film of chiral pneumatic mesoporous silica. So as you can tell, there's a huge contrast between the two polarizations. And for that reason, we're looking at the possibility of using these materials for security applications where a person could very quickly verify from an iridescent tag that it was the right-handedness which comes from our cellulose uh, template with just a pair of 3D glasses. Okay, well for the next two hours, I would like to tell you about, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to tell you about making even more flexible materials. And I'm gonna tell you a, a bit of our story about making chiral pneumatic plastics and hydrogels using the same approach of templating with the cellulose nanocrystals. So hydrogels are cross-linked hydrophilic polymers and they're super absorbent. When they absorb water, they undergo very large changes in dimension. So you've probably seen um, hydrogels. This is a photograph of a hydrogel swollen in this person's hand. They're used in contact lenses and also used in these inflatable or these expandable toys. Um, probably the most common application that you're familiar with would be baby diapers. Those contain um, a hydrogel. So we had an idea that if we could make a chiral pneumatic hydrogel, then when it swells, that would change the pitch of that structure and would change the color. So we, it, it actually, it's funny to put up a slide like this that makes it look really easy. It took us almost two years to figure out how to do this. Um, we take the cellulose nanocrystal suspension in water, do a polymerization, and then we get the chiral pneumatic hydrogel with the cellulose nanocrystals in the helical organization. This really does a disservice to the, the postdoc and a couple of students that worked on this project for years. Here's a photograph of the hydrogels we can make. Um, this is a, a um, hydrogel that is swollen in water and it's reflecting infrared light, so it looks colorless. And this hydrogel is made of the same, exactly the same material, but it has the cellulose nanocrystals organized into a helix that's reflecting green light. If you look at these materials under an electron microscope, you can again see the layered structure that results from the nanostructured organization of the cellulose nanocrystals. Now, if you put this hydrogel into water, it rapidly expands and that changes its color from reflecting 550 nanometers all the way to about 850 nanometers in pure water. But in between, with different ratios of ethanol to water, we can control the color of the film that we get. And so we can actually use this to detect different concentrations of ethanol in water. So we can sense the concentration of your vodka versus moonshine, for example. And it's completely reversible as well. We can modify the hydrogel that we use. To, if we use polyacrylic acid, then we get a pH sensor. So when you put this in water with different pHs, you get a color change across the spectrum depending on the pH of the solution. We can also make polymers that are temperature sensitive, so they undergo a, a sudden change when it goes through a transition at 37 degrees, and we can see a change in the reflection wavelength um, at that temperature. So coming back to this uh, hydrogel that you saw before, it's green, it's reflecting light about 550 nanometers. When you put this sample into water, it looks like that. So what we can do is we can photo pattern our hydrogel and by irradiating it for doing the polymerization for different amounts of time in different regions, we change the amount that it swells in water. And as a consequence, we can make multicolor patterns emerge from our materials. So you can imagine that your shower curtain would look like this until you turned on the water, and then you get the UBC logo on your, on your shower curtain. 
What's that? How about the naked lady? The n <laughs> no comment. So another thing we've been able to do is to transfer this structure to plastic materials. So again, this is a simplified version of it. We take our nanocrystalline cellulose suspension, add a resin precursor and let it dry into this helical structure. And then we cure the resin and remove the nanocrystalline cellulose to get a mesoporous piece of plastic. So this is a chiral pneumatic mesoporous plastic. And here's a photograph of one sheet of plastic that we made. This is a few centimeters in across. And it has an iridescent color that mimics this, excuse me, this beetle that we photographed at the UBC Biodiversity Museum. Now here's photographs of four different samples of plastic that we made. These are phenol formaldehyde resins, and normally they would be the same color, but they have color that originates from this chiral pneumatic um, organization of holes in their interior, and they just have different pitches for these four different samples. So we can tune the colors of these plastics by changing the pitch of those spiraling holes. If you take this piece of plastic and you put it into water, it swells dramatically and changes color as the pitch increases. So here's a photograph of a piece of plastic in pure ethanol, the same piece in a mixture of ethanol and water, and then a photograph of the same one swollen in pure water. And so you can see how vibrant the colors are and how much they change as it swells. One thing that we recently found was that we can change the amount that these plastics swell by treating regions of them either with hydrogen chloride, hydrochloric acid, or with formaldehyde. So if we treat a region of it with, hi with uh, hydrochloric acid, then when it swells, it doesn't swell as much as it, the untreated region. And if you treat a region with formaldehyde, then it swells more when it gets wet than the untreated region. And so this allows you to imprint patterns onto the plastics. So what we did here was we took a dry sample. The, the, this part has been treated with HCl. The middle is, has not been treated. And the right side has been treated with formaldehyde. And when you put it into 90% ethanol in water, then you can see this pattern. So the right-hand side with the formaldehyde treated swells the most, and the rest barely swells at all. When you go to 40% alcohol, then you get the German flag. The left side looks yellow. The middle swells intermediate, and the right side now has swollen so that it's reflecting infrared light. And in pure water, we get a pattern like this. So you can use this to detect different concentrations of ethanol or different reagents in water, for example. And so using this principle, what we did was we took an inkjet printer and modified it so that it could print with HCl solution. And we've printed a pattern onto this piece of plastic using our inkjet printer. How many of you can see the pattern in here? You can't see it at all, right? There's no pattern that you can detect. But as soon as you take this piece of plastic and get it wet, then it looks like that. So we can print fairly high resolution pictures on this that only become observed when the, when the plastic gets wet. And we can print the NSERC logo, UBC. We can write text, and we can write graphics onto the plastic. OK, I still have a couple minutes here. I'm almost at the end. So I've been telling you about hydrogels and plastics, that when they swell, the pitch gets elongated and they change color. But you could equally imagine taking one of our pieces of plastic and squeezing it or stepping on it to change the color. And that would compress the pitch, which would blue shift the reflection wavelength. So this actually works. If you take this red piece of plastic and you treat it with a rolling pin, then it turns blue. So all we've done is we have compressed the pitch, so now it's reflecting a shorter wavelength of light. And we use reflection spectroscopy to see the original sample reflected light about 600 nanometers, and it shifts to 500 nanometers after our rolling pin treatment. Now what we can do is we can tune the wavelength of light that these plastics reflect across the whole spectrum by adding salts. 
And in fact, we can even tune it into the infrared. So here's a piece of plastic that is reflecting infrared light, which is just a slightly longer wavelength than our eyes can detect. This is about 850 nanometers that it's reflecting. So as I mentioned, if you press the film, then you shorten the pitch. And in this case, what we did was we took this piece of plastic that's reflecting infrared light, and we put it over top of a UBC keychain. Then we gave it the same rolling pin treatment. And anywhere there's a raised feature, that compresses the pitch in that region into the visible spectrum. So you can now see a photonic pattern emerge. And in this case, it's got the UBC keychain imprinted. And this is a photograph of what that same piece looks like when you put it over a white surface. So it's a colorless, transparent plastic that has an imprinted photonic pattern that's only visible on a black surface. And so what we've developed is kind of a new imprintable photonics technology here. Those ones are permanently um, compressed. So after you treat them with the rolling pin, then it never goes back to the original shape. So those have been sitting on my desk for years, and they don't change color. But what we have been very interested in recently is using the same concept for pressure sensing. So if you can make ones that respond much faster, then you could use them for pressure sensing in various applications. And what we did was we developed a pressure sensor that when you compress it, it, compre it changes the pitch of the, of the sample and changes the wavelength of light that's reflected. And we can measure the pressure that's applied to it by measuring the wavelength of light reflected from the sample. And so here's a video of a sample that's reflecting near infrared light. This person presses it, and now it goes into the visible spectrum, and it comes back to the near infrared. Again, they press it, it goes to green, and then it comes back to red and back to the infrared. So this is still a little bit slow to be used for most applications. If we can get this response time into milliseconds towards a second, then there are a number of applications where this pressure sensing could be applied. So that brings me to the end of my talk. I hope you've enjoyed this journey through taking a cellulose nanocrystals, a relatively new nanomaterial, and applying it to create a diversity of, of uh, new materials. We've been able to make a variety of new materials with tunable chiral pneumatic structures. We can make glass, plastic, hydrogels. I didn't have time to talk to you about other metal oxides, um, semiconductors, and uh, even carbon that we can make with a chiral pneumatic structure. These are promising, I think, for sensing, imprintable photonics, window coatings, and a variety of other potential applications. And it's really interesting, I, I, I still find this natural connection to the hierarchical structures of the beetle shells fascinating that nature beat us only by about um, half a billion years. I got scooped. So I didn't do any of this chemistry myself. I have a really terrific group of graduate students, undergraduates, and postdocs who have worked with me over the years. And you know, it's, this is what gets me excited, is coming in and being able to talk to a group of really motivated and keen students like you. And every day I get to give lectures to the undergrads who are similarly excited and motivated about science. And these guys are, are a terrific group as well. I need to thank my collaborator at FP Innovations, Wadud Hamad, who's been working with me for many years. Um, I want to thank these organizations who have supported us, especially NSERC. Uh, that has generously funded our research for many years. And with that, I would like to once again thank the organizers for the invitation to speak today. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Yes. Single curve in your material, could yep. you then prevent it from cracking by growing it on a curved surface or drying it on a curved surface? So I, I think the 
curved surface alone would not prevent it from cracking because I think there's still the same pressure gradients that build up. It's mostly from the condensation of the glass. Okay. Even, if you, even if you don't have the cellulose nanocrystals and try and make a thin film of the glass, it still cracks a, a lot okay. from this process. But growing, growing these onto curved surfaces is a really interesting thing that we're, we've just started looking into. If that was something like that, you could solve your architect's problem. Mm-hmm. No, you're absolutely right. I think that there's some potential for using them for either currency or passports, for example, or other um, tag -ins. Pretty awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Bob. Is there an enantiomeric form of NCC? <laughs> an enantiomeric form yeah. of it? Yeah, so this is left-handed, right? So, yes. I mean, if, if, if there was a, a, a form of NCC that was right-handed, then you could simply form, formulate or Junior yeah. pitch, yeah. just by formulation, so right? All the materials that we make are left-handed helical structures, and nobody has observed the right-handed helical structure of cellulose nanocrystals, except in one case, which is there's a berry that has a chiral nematic organization of cellulose nanocrystals for its coloration. And I showed a photo of it actually on the structural color slide. And it has a combination of left-handed and right-handed helical structures. So that berry has figured out how to organize the cellulose into the right-handed structure. But we haven't. The berry is much that, smarter that, than us. I guess I'm not saying cellulose, but there's other carbohydrates, right? That, oh, yes. That are of, of opposite handedness, right? Yep. Even, even with uh, things like ethyl cellulose or hydroxypropyl cellulose, you can get the right handed structure. Right. But you can't template with it the same way you can with the cellulose nanocrystals. It, it doesn't work. Yep. Um, here, first. Okay. Uh, two questions. First, how many Hawaiian t-shirts do you have? <laughs> <laughs> I have I have approximately 13, 12 or 13 Hawaiian shirts. And I restock every Pacific Chem, which is a chemistry conference that happens every five years. So I will get a new wardrobe in about a month and five days from now. <laughs> Actually, this particular shirt is not a Hawaiian shirt. This is from Okinawa, which is the southernmost island in Japan, which has very similar clothes to Hawaii, but this particular shirt is not a Hawaiian shirt. Okay. Yes. Uh, the second question uh, about the materials that you said you will use to make a shower curtain. Recently, I would be thinking about the shower curtain, uh, the thing that making the baby part. Um, I mean, is it waterproof? Like, when you put the uh, material in water, yep. so it decomposes? Like, will it? No, we've had some of these materials swollen in water for more than a year, and there's no change in their color, for example. Um, we can also make, I mean, I showed a lot of materials that change with water, but we can easily surface treat them to make them water resistant so they don't swell in water. Um, and the glass, the glass I showed you becomes colorless and transparent with water, but we can treat that with a water repellent siloxane that makes it so it, you can put it in a beaker of water and it doesn't change color. How about to make a shower curtain is, uh, that says not waterproof when it gets wet? <laughs> it dissolves when it gets wet? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, there are a lot more questions up here. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I know you mentioned that um, yeah. you said something about berries having like both the left-handed and right-handed structures. So yes. So that, that berry, the optical properties of that berry were only studied very recently. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I can't recall exactly what the distribution of left-handed and right-handed regions were, but they, they used optical microscopy to look at different regions of the berry and found that some of them are left-handed helical structures and some are right-handed. So like I don't, that's right, there's separate regions, like separate, almost, separate cells, you could call them, or separate domains that are left-handed and separate domains that are right-handed. Um, and to be honest, I don't know if the distribution is exactly one-to-one -one so that it would be a racemic mixture. 
there may be more of one handedness over the other. I, I'm not I'm not sure. Um, yeah. So the plastics are not brittle at all. The plastics are plastic. Um, so we have, we, they are, you can cut them with scissors and you can bend them. The glass is brittle. So th the glass is about 50 microns thick, which makes it really brittle. It's hard to handle big sheets of it. Um, there are a couple tricks that we can use to make them less brittle. One is to add a plasticizer. So I showed you the organosilicas, which we could, we could treat. Um, you can bend those films. Um, another trick is to coat them onto a substrate so that the brittleness isn't such a factor. So if we can coat them onto a sheet, a sheet of thick glass or onto a plastic, then we don't have to worry about the brittleness. I can do the first verse if you like. He's a drink. <laughs> uh, it's only two, it's only like two minutes, there's one, like six minutes. There's antimony, arsenic, aluminum, selenium, and hydrogen, and oxygen, nitrogen, and rhenium, and nickel, neodymium, neptunium, germanium, and anamorism, uranium, and zirconium, lutetium, vanadium, and lanthanum, and osmium, and astium, radium, and golden, protectinium, and gallium, and iodine, and thorium, and thulium, and thallium. That's all. <laughs> <laughs>